Plenty has been said and written in response to the question often posed by students and novice engineers, what's the correct order of processors in a channel strip? Traditional responses range from the non-committal, there are no real hard and fast rules, to the old reliable, it depends. Well, those responses aren't wrong, but there are reasons for suggesting a particular sequence of effects, at least for the most standard applications. Let's take a look at the question of processing order. It's generally a good idea to place processors that require the cleanest, least processed signal to do their job properly at the beginning of any effects chain. Remember, in a DAW, the effects inserts flow from top to bottom, so the first effect will be at the top of the insert section. Traditionally, this has usually been taken to be dynamics processors, which are threshold dependent. But before I get to them, nowadays there's another type of processing that also performs better with the cleanest, driest version of a signal available. That's pitch processing. And here, of course, I'm talking about real-time pitch correction plugins like Autotune and its many clones, not edit-based pitch processing like Melodyne or FlexPitch. Aside from that familiar special effect they can do, most of the time the application for these is transparent pitch correction, so smoothly executed that you don't even know it's working. To accomplish this, these tools need to analyze the waveform to detect both pitch-to-pitch -pitch changes and frequency variations within notes, and the most successful pitch detection will probably be achieved working with the original waveform before it's been altered with any other effects. Like most engineers, I usually suggest that pitch correction be applied only when absolutely necessary. But when it is deemed necessary, I'd place the pitch correction plugin first in the chain to give it the best chance to do what it does as smoothly and unnoticeably as possible. After that, the traditional ordering would start with dynamics. In particular, if the track has leakage, like room sounds or headphone chatter, that needs to be addressed, a noise gate would be the first dynamics effect to be employed. Remember, a noise gate is a type of expander that takes unwanted audio, like leakage, which is usually made up of the quieter sounds in a track, below a user set threshold, and reduces their level further, in the case of gating, all the way down until they're inaudible, gated out. To do its job properly, the gate needs to clearly distinguish between the desirable sounds above the threshold level and the quieter, undesirable sounds below it. Naturally, you'd want to avoid proceeding it with any processing that might change the relative level of those two components of the signal, especially compression. A compressor's job is to reduce dynamic range so it would end up bringing louder sounds and quieter sounds closer in level, making it that much harder, if not impossible, for a gate to successfully separate them to get rid of the quiet ones. So, if it's going to be in use, a noise gate should precede pretty much everything else. And that brings us to the most contentious question, the classic chicken-egg debate when it comes to audio processing order. Which comes first, EQ or compression? Well, this is one case where the old evasions, no hard and fast rules, and it depends, really do hold true. You can place these two effects in either ordering, and you'll do just fine. However, conventional wisdom has always suggested that, once again, the dynamics processor, in this case the compressor, go ahead of the other. The idea behind this is that compression is threshold-based. When you've dialed up the exact effect you want from a compressor, it's dependent on the level of the incoming signal continuing to hit the threshold at the same level it was when you determined your settings. But EQ, besides altering tone, can also affect overall level as well. So if it's inserted ahead of the compressor, and you dial up large boosts or cuts with it after setting up the compression effect, this can then cause the signal to hit the compressor's threshold either harder or softer than it had been, sometimes noticeably altering the compression effect unintentionally. Inserting the EQ after the compressor would let you dial up as much EQ as you wanted without the compression characteristic being affected. Now, this advice is generally intended for novices. More experienced mixers would know to avoid this by compensating for any large EQ boosts or cuts to maintain the same level in and out of the plugin, which would negate any unintended effect on the compressor. I'll be talking about that whole concept of gain staging later in the course. Or, they'll be more likely to apply subtler EQ, and again, in that case, any effect on the compression threshold would likely be negligible. For example, in mastering, where the EQ settings are often on the order of a dB or so, I typically insert the EQ, if I'm using one, ahead of the compressor. In fact, some people feel that having a compressor follow the EQ can help to keep any unwanted effects from strong EQ boosts in check. Again, for example, 
You might feel that you needed an unusually strong or sharp EQ boost at a certain frequency, but when you applied it, certain notes took on an unpleasant character. A compressor following the EQ might be able to catch just those notes, keeping them under control well enough to make the EQ work okay. I know some engineers who might even have compression both ahead of and following an EQ. The upshot is, there really is no right or wrong when it comes to EQ compression order. If you generally follow good gain staging practice, either way can work just fine. With delay-based effects, where I'd place one kind of depends on the specifics of the effect. For some delay effects, like slap echo or doubling, I'd be inclined to insert it after other processors, like EQ and compression. But not always. If I was creating a stereo doubling for a mono track, I might want to process the two sides of the signal differently, assuming I had plugins that allowed for that. So in that case, I might add, say, EQ or amp sims after the signal was split and doubled. With certain short delay-based effects, like flanging and chorusing, if the effect was an integral part of the sound itself, I might insert it prior to other processors. For example, if I recorded an electric guitar run through a real stompbox chorus through a real amp, obviously the pedal's effect would be subject to the amp's distortion and tonal character. If I were using a virtual chorus pedal through a plug-in amp sim, I still might choose to insert it early in the chain, as if the signal had come in that way off a mic, to get the same effect. So, once again, it depends, seems to rule a day. Reverb is usually the last thing I'd add to a signal chain. Typically, I wouldn't even have it in the channel strip itself. It'd be inserted in an aux channel and fed from sends, which pretty much always follow all the insert effects. I'll be talking about that particular hookup in the next clip, so I won't get into it here. But I will mention one situation where I might have a reverb or ambience type effect inserted earlier on in the chain. Sometimes, if I have a signal that's a bit too dry and dead, maybe an overly dry sampled piano, say, or an acoustic guitar recording made in a really dead vocal booth. I might enhance it with a convolution reverb, utilizing a sample of piano or guitar body resonance. Since this would normally be part of the original recording, if it had been made in a more appropriate space, I'd be inclined to insert that effect near the top of the chain, ahead of any of the usual processing, like EQ, compression, or delay effects. So those processors would affect the ambience-enhanced signal, just like they'd affect a properly ambient recording. But that scenario would be the exception. For general-purpose reverb applications, again, the reverb would usually go last, or be inserted in an aux. And that's where I'll pick up next time.